next session is looking at the crossover of documentaries and factual content. I'd like to introduce Margaret Robertson. Margaret Robertson uh, was the editor of Edge magazine, the UK's premier video games magazine for a long time. She then worked as a consultant on lots of gaming projects, including a lot for us at Channel 4. She's now uh, the co-director of Hide and Seek, which is a really innovative a digital media organization that uses gaming and gameplay in a variety of different contexts, um, both real-life games, uh, online games, and uh, uh, for a huge range of clients, including uh, major film companies, uh, UK public institutions, and broadcasters like Channel 4. So, Margaret Robertson. This is um, where we discover that I've got the wrong presentation lined up. Uh, uh oh, spoilers. Don't look. <laughs> Hello. Um, Matt's done all my introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm speechless, which many of you will know is a, is a common occurrence for me. Um, I'm, uh, as Matt said, um, someone with a very long gaming heritage. I've been working in the games industry on and off for um, more than a decade, moving from uh, to kind of traditional entertainment console games through to more... Um, innovative partner projects with broadcasters, film studios, public institutions, charities, um, and have in that time kind of had an opportunity to uh, sort of form a very wide survey of everything that is going on in games, which is really a, a colossal amount and a colossally varied amount. Um, I'm now at Hide and Seek, which I don't need to introduce because Matt's done it so beautifully. Um, we're a game design studio who makes um, games on all on any platform, so real world, running about, street games, board games, card games, tabletop games, phone games, browser games, console games, um, and often in partnership with really interesting other projects. So two big things we did last year were um, we effectively developed uh, a playable prequel to the um, Robert Denny Jones Sherlock Holmes movie, which I'm sure you all raced to last Boxing Day, um, which was a, a really, really big multimedia project closely interconnected with the production process of that film, so working with um, sets and costumes, actors, production designers, um, to produce a, a, a sort of meaningful partner project. Um, and earlier this year we finished um, Take Trumps, which is a gallery game for uh, Take Modern, uh, which is an iPhone, play, play, iPhone game you play in the gallery, um, which uh, invites you to pick artworks that you think will score highly <laughs> Uh, in certain categories. Um, battle mode is the most popular, where you imagine what would happen if the artworks came to life and had a fight, um, which in Tate is um, surprisingly entertaining. Um, and, and, and most of the last 10 years, I have spent standing in front of slides that say that only slightly more articulately. Um, and I would do that for about 20 minutes, and then I would do this for about 20 minutes. Um, because for a very, very long time, we've, we've been working against a lot of preconceptions about what games are. Um, and a lot of people who either, when you say games, think of Space Invaders from 30 years ago or think of GTA from a Daily Mail headline and not very much in between. Um, and for so long, I mean, since, since games be began in any kind of serious commercial way, there's always been really, really interesting thought-provoking projects, always been people using them to explore interesting ideas, interesting elements of the human condition, they never get very much um, kind of publicity and very much oxygen. So I would often end up talking people through um, kind of particularly iconic um, sort of serious game projects that try and use the power that games have in interesting ways. Uh, and we might talk a bit about Global Conflict, which some of you will know, which is now a long-running series um, uh, helping people who live in conflict zones to get a perspective from the other side of the... Um, battle lines. Uh, this, this is one um, set in Israel and Palestine where you play a young reporter whose job it is, is to interview different people from both communities and form newspapers that reflect the full story of what's going on. Um, I would probably have shown you JFK Reloaded just to make everybody wince a little bit. Um, this was a, a documentary game challenging you to prove your theory about the JFK assassination by taking and making whatever shot you think killed him. Uh, which absolutely horrified a lot of people, but raised for me some very, very interesting questions um, about why we are so comfortable with reconstructions of these kind of 
uh, scenes and questions and problems. The JFK conspiracy theory is fundamentally a ballistics problem, right? It's fundamentally asking questions about um, range and aim and bullet speed and all the rest of it. We're very happy doing that in a linear medium. We're in powerfully uncomfortable doing it in a gaming medium. Um, I would definitely have talked about Mon Industria's um, The McDonald's Game, which I still highly commend to any of you. This sets you the task of running um, not just a McDonald's, but the whole McDonald's empire. So you're managing everything from uh, bulldozing the rainforests to um, spitting in the burgers. Um, and what's interesting is you start often out with very, very good intentions, uh, where you're going to run a really good multinational soya-based fast food empire um, and find it incredibly difficult. Find that you start taking little shortcuts that seem innocuous but then don't. Um, and five years in, you're, you're spending millions of pounds on misinformation campaigns to brand up school textbooks in order to disguise the enormity of the crimes against humanity that you're committing. Um, arguably, well, not arguably, very straightforwardly, more polemic and protest gaming than documentary gaming, but but very, very interesting and illuminating um, at the same time. Some of the projects that, that Matt's been talking about that I've had a chance to work on over the years um, have taken extremely challenging content and put them into game form. This is uh, a game called Sneeze, I also highly recommend to you, uh, which is from a project that we did in collaboration with Channel 4 and the Wellcome Trust to look at how we might get uh, today's young teenagers to think seriously about the really big... Um, ethical questions that advances in, um, in genetic science uh, are going to bring in the next few years, which is not an easy subject to make palatable for bored teenagers. Um, and I would talk a lot about why games are so amazingly interesting, what makes them so fertile for this kind of use, that games give you dynamic systems to play with. So that thing about JFK being a, a ballistics problem is, is not just me being glib. This, this really, games really give your audience a chance to get their hands on the, on the levers and the fulcrums of whatever it is that you're trying to talk about. And maybe that's a really straightforward engineering problem. Maybe it's you know, a, a big, complex set of interconnected climate change data. Um, maybe it's some very, very intimate, personal, emotional triangle of, of different people's competing needs and different attentions. But nearly everything that we want to talk about in the human condition is reflective of some kind of dynamic system and games let you actually roll your sleeves up and get involved with them. I would probably talk about social interaction and how games are incredible in terms of giving you little engines and mechanisms for getting people to go out and talk to people, to have conversations, to collaborate, to compete, to find out things about what make themselves tick and what make the people around them tick. Um, I would definitely have hammered my behaviour change gong um, in terms of um, illustrating the extent to which games can be really powerful in changing what people do. Games have made me do completely crazy things. Games are about to make me do completely crazy things later this month. Um, they are very good at reaching out into our lives and incentivizing us um, to learn things or do things or make choices that we wouldn't otherwise make. And at the moment, the mainstream games industry is pouring billions of dollars into making that behavior change be behavior change that's centered around buying the right game and going to see the right movie, but there's no reason it couldn't be something more interesting. Um, and I would have talked about how interesting things get when you suddenly are in a, in a two-way creation process with your audience. Um, there's, a, there's a famous Brian Eno quote that I've pinched from many more talented speakers, um, which is that all interactive projects ship unfinished. If you are producing something that somebody else needs to play or use or touch, it's not, it's not finished until they show up and do it. Everything that, you, everything that I've ever made, I've shipped unfinished. Everything I've ever made, I really have shipped unfinished, but that's a maybe different story. Um, and there's all kinds of really interesting possibilities for developing projects that aren't necessarily just about disseminating stuff that you know in interesting ways to an audience, but creating a two-way flow where they, where the project that you create actually enables you to pull data back from them or insights back from them in kind of really interesting ways. I would have done all of that. I've been doing all of that for 10 years. Um, and I promised myself I wasn't going to do it today. Um, and I kind of haven't. Um, because as Matt says, we're, we're, I kind of had it. We've, we've been banging this drum for a long time. The people who get it are already doing it. And they're already doing it incredibly well. And the people who don't get it and are not interested, it's entirely their prerogative. I'm, I'm kind of stepping back from proselytizing from here on in. Um, all of this stuff is out there. All of this stuff is exciting. All of it is accessible and can be um, kind of brought into to your creative process if you want to. And the, the thing that the flip that you often need to make 
and that I've made over the past, even as a game maker I've made over the past 10 years, um, is, to, is to think about the thing that you're making last. It's, it's really easy because we all spend a load of time learning craft and learning tools and, and, and learning practice and thinking, this is, this is how I make, uh, and finding yourself springboarding from the how rather than the what. And, and now what we do, and a big part of the ethos behind Hide and Seek and a big part of why we're completely platform agnostic is that this is, this is our chain of creation. Is to first of all think, well, what is, it, what is it that we're trying to do? What is it that we want to talk about? What is it that we think is interesting? What is it that we want to change? Then we think about who we want to have that conversation with or that impact with. Then we think about what does that, what does that mean this needs to be? Does it need to be a little bit of linear stuff that will exist for an hour and be amazingly spectacular? Is that something that we want to have an involvement with people over a, you know, a, a week or a year or a decade or their entire life? Is this something that we want people to absorb all of or absorb little bits of? And then when we know the answers to all of that stuff, we think, ah, okay, so I know I want to do a project where I need to make five minute bits of video. Where am I going to put those? Where am I going to find a, a distribution platform for them? And I think of that last, which is a whole different way from thinking, I'm somebody who makes flash games or I'm somebody who makes um, film documentary or I'm an animator. And it changes the way you work because it means you're always finding collaborators. It means you're often having to work in areas that you're not an expert. And that's a, that's a big choice to make. That's a big shift to make. And, and I think that's another reason that I'm stopped, you know, trying to stop myself preaching about this stuff. Because for people who, you know, I'm, I'm very open to, to being criticised for being a, you know, a jack of all trades and master of none. I think there are issues here about what it does to the things that you make when you're working in all of these different ways. Um, and I'm not here to necessarily say that um, it's the right way to go, but it's an unbelievably exciting way to go. You don't often get to do this. This is a moment in time when this stuff is getting defined. It's getting created. You're doing everything for the first time. Um, I find that unbelievably stimulating. It's not an opportunity I would in any way miss. Um, and whilst this is, this is a gag, I really don't believe this. I do think there is absolutely every reason to keep making things in traditional formats in traditional ways. Most of what I... I I'm the biggest fan of is produced in this way. But I do think the very fact that you're here today indicates that you kind of have some interest in what this stuff might do. And these guys are about to show you what it can mean when you put all of this into practice. So I guess I failed in my not preaching attempt. But that's my introduction to Documentary Games. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you very much. Okay, so next up is, is Nick Cohen, if you want to start getting ready. Um, Nick really is one of the true pioneers of, of cross-platform working broadcasters. He was working on huge-scale projects with a red button at the BBC uh, many years before some of you were probably even out of a uh, 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 formal education. Um, and is now, not that you're old or anything, Nick, but um, and, and has continued to lead the way in the work that the BBC does around multi-platform ever since then. So genuinely one of the uh, first and most important people working in this field. So he's going to be talking about some of the stuff he's doing at the BBC um, at the moment across a range of audiences, um, if you can uh, find the website and get it up online. So with no further ado, Nick Cohen. Thank you. There we go, it's an empty web page. So, um, uh, Matt said, uh, could you just show a recent project uh, about a game and just talk about that a little bit to get us going? So, I thought, well, um, we're in Sheffield, so everyone's here for a good bit of depressing documentary, something incredibly worthy, maybe Burma or, I don't know, prisoner abuse in Iraq or something like that. Um, so I thought I'd show you Wallace and Gromit, um, which is the latest uh, thing that we've just done. Uh, it was up here a minute ago, but it's just I'm, been shut. It's so my fault, I'm sorry. Let me just, just bear with me one second while I get it out. But basically, um, I don't know if anyone's seen this yet, but Wallace and Gromit uh, have just started their own TV studio in their basement. <laughs> and they started broadcasting last night to the nation. Um, and this is Wallace and Gromit's World of Invention. And this is Wallace's show dedicated to the most exciting and uh, brilliant inventions and contraptions from uh, all over the world. So it's, a, it's quite innovative, actually. It's a, a mix of animation and live action. So it's quite good fun. Uh, but there's a serious purpose behind this program, which is really to get a mainstream uh, 
BBC One audience interested in sort of engineering and the science behind engineering and the science behind invention. Um, so we've done a whole load of stuff around this, and the intention, Ardman came up with this brilliant plan where they wanted to use Wallace and Gromit as champions for a sort of nationwide, uh, let's get everyone out there, not just understanding some of these things about uh, engineering, but actually trying it for themselves. Actually, we want to get people actually out in their sheds, you know, dads with their sons, inventors at schools or colleges or, you know, retired people actually building things. So we've done a whole load of stuff around this, um, around this sense of how can we get the nation out there building real-world stuff. Uh, so we've done a big website, and this has got these downloadable kits on it. You can click here, and you can make everything from a, a balloon hovercraft to a, there's a weird ejector seat one. They're all quite good fun. So you actually sort of get steps through uh, guides and videos and so on. And we've launched this competition where we're trying to find the most um, imaginative invention or contraption from anyone in the UK and people are sort of already submitting videos of like bizarre contraptions that they've made in their sheds and things like that. It's all quite good fun. Um, and the prize there actually, if you're interested, is you get you or your contraption animated into a future argument of production, which I think is pretty cool. So yeah. Um, but we did think that um, actually this is quite a big ask of people. You know, people, people, not everyone is ready to go out there and actually start soldering things and, and getting things um, going like that. So what we wanted to do was try and give people a virtual environment where they could play about with um, some of the concepts that we're trying to, um, trying to convey here. So uh, what we've done, sorry, this, this is, uh, I just need to move this slightly so that you can see it. Um, so what we did was we actually built a game, and this, this game... Uh, allows you to create uh, a series of increasingly... Wow, your computer's really... Yeah, <laughs> completely booby-trapped. Can I... No, no, it's fine, it's, right. it's fine. I'm getting there. Um, so basically what this uh, allows you to do, this game, um, it's, it, it's not the most exciting thing to watch, but it's brilliant to play. You basically you step through a, a series of increasingly complicated challenges. It's like a physics game. Um, where you, you basically build up your competence at building increasingly sophisticated contraptions. And as you step through the levels, you, uh, you start to release new parts that you can bolt together in interesting ways to create new uh, machines. And then you need to uh, test them with your, your crash test Wallace, uh, who you've got here. So if I do that wrong and then I press go, you'll see that he sort of flops somehow and gets hit by the, hit by the beam. So, yeah, anyway, but, so I won't go through it all in detail now. But basically, this is just a little training plan to show you how to play. But you build up this, these machines and you step through this process and you gradually learn more and more um, about the physics that affect actual engineering contraptions. And as you go through it, it introduces you with links through to the kits where you can actually see how you could make something using that particular device in real life. But anyway, why have I shown you this, apart from the fact that it's our latest thing and I thought it would be quite nice to show it off a bit because it's rather good? Um, the reason why I've shown this is because I think it, above all else, it's really good fun. It's a really good fun game to play, and if you play around with it a bit, you'll realise that it's very addictive and it's and it's it's a great laugh. And I think one of the problems that I think um, there is about the combination of documentaries and games is that all too often um, we go a bit too into the worthy territory. The whole kind of serious games thing, I think, is great, but at the same time. Uh, I, I sort of think you might be sort of turning off a lot of people because the gameplay itself isn't always that compelling. It's really more about making a statement that you're trying to do something about an issue rather than creating something that people really want to play. This, I mean, this has been brilliant. Obviously, it's got Wallace and Gromit on it, but the strength of the gameplay has led it... In the first about a week or so, we had 750,000 people play it, which was pretty good, and, and it's going up all the time. Um, and I think that's because it's great fun to play. So uh, there you go, that's just something because I thought it'd be quite good fun. But also to raise the question, why does anyone actually go and play a game? And if we want to combine serious documentary subjects with gameplay, how can we do things which are actually really good fun? Um, how can we combine really good fun and gameplay with some sort of serious message or serious um, learning or educational outcome? That's a very good point, and one we'll definitely pick up on Q&As in the panel later, and I'd like all of your opinions on that. Thank you very much, Nick. Um...
Next up. Are you, are you going next, Paul? Could do. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Paul Benoon, who's the director of digital at Something Else, a truly multi platform production company that work across radio, broadcast, new media, games, and virtually anything else that they can get money to do. Uh, we've worked with uh, Something Else on a few projects at Channel 4, um, but for my money, they are doing some of the most interesting and innovative stuff out there in the market right now. Are you going to talk a bit about Super Me as a project? Yes. Right, exactly. so I won't, I won't talk more about that, but um, some of the stuff that something else have been doing around games, not only do they make games for broadcasters, they also work for some of the big console AAA games manufacturers as well, so they have a true heritage in doing games on a number of platforms. And if you're now ready, there you go. Just I'll hand over to Paul Benoon. Changing my name. So yes, I'm going to talk about um, a project that um, we were extremely lucky to have done, um, I'll say, um, for Channel for Education, um, in collaboration, in fact, with Preloaded, um, there's Phil from Preloaded, and um, Margaret Robertson was also working on that project as well. So um, again, so Matt described about what something else does, um, so I'm not going to, um, but what I'm going to do is, first of all, Describe about why I think specifically discussion around games is interesting to documentaries um, at, in the current, you know, at, at right now um, by talking you through what this thing does. So this is SuperMe. PlaySuperMe.com um, is where you can find it. Now, we describe it not to the intended users. To the intended users, it's a game, but to um, people like you, I would describe it as a system of video, games, and interactive goodies that's designed to teach teenagers about the control they have over their own happiness. So there's a lot of things in there. First of all, if you use that appalling word gamification, which I thoroughly despise, um, you can say that what we're doing is we're turning the understanding of happiness, of resilience, into a game, which is quite a, a bold, quite a, an insanely stupid thing to attempt to do. Um, Except, I think you could argue, the reason why I'm so proud of this and the reason why I say, I, I say I'm, I'm lucky to have worked on it is because we did it. We actually managed to pull it off. Um, normally, when you make a thing, you never sort of see the you know, detailed research on it. In this instance, we're very lucky that um, Channel 4 did a, some very detailed research on it. And it came back, and it sort of, you know, it was actually some of the guys in our studio were actually in tears when they're reading this stuff because they'd, done, they'd made a thing that made people who had, you know, who had lost their parents or who were being profoundly bullied or um, were worried about their self-image. We gave them tools to be able to become more resilient and deal with this stuff. And that's an amazing, an amazing achievement to have been able to, to do. I, I, can't claim, I can't, I'd love to claim all the credit for it, so, uh, so I will. Mm -hmm. um, it was me. Um, now, before I show it to you, I, there's one other word that I kind of want to flag up. And it's this word system. Um, Margaret mentioned it as well. Um, it's a very important word. It's, a, it's got some very specific technical reasons, some scientific reasons. Um, a couple of them may be paraphrased as um, a collection of objects that work together for a common goal. Or you could say that a system is a, effectively a machine for processing energy or for processing information. And Super Me is both those things. It's got a whole bunch of... In fact, why, why don't I show it to you right now? Um, here it is. This, this is the homepage for Super Me. Um, it's con it consists of, as I mentioned, it consists of some documentary um, films and also some, some very beautiful games. And all, all of this stuff is sort of held in a, in a, in a framework that does, it kind of guides you through it so that it looks at what you're... Um, looks at what you've, what you've done and how well you've played a certain game and then gives you some advice. You know, why don't you play this game? Why don't you watch this video? Um, what we did is we, um, after a huge amount of um, research into resilience theory, we, we kind of made four basic um, sort of qualities of resilience and happiness. Resilience, and um, we, we call them wisdom, ability, influence and connection because I think they're, they're quite easy to, uh, to communicate to um, to people. So let me just show you a bit of video really quickly so you can get a sense of the, the quality of the stuff that's in there for starters. Um, I'll show you a, a, uh, a nice short thing here. 
Now watch out at the very end. You'll see some balls falling down with some numbers on them, and I'll, I'll explain what they are. Just realised this gag isn't going to work. People at the back. <laughs> so I've just scored um, thirty-five wisdom points and forty-five. Of another kind of point, which are given to my sister, given to me here, which I can then log in via Facebook and, and keep those points. And the, the this, as I mentioned, the whole, the whole, um, the whole, all the elements in the system uh, track what you are, are tracked to try and uh, give whoever's using the uh, the thing um, some content that can that's that's designed to be of best use to them at that time. And if you sort of compare that to how one makes a documentary, it's, it's very very different. You're in, in, a documentary tends to be a standalone thing. Um, in this instance, and I, I could show you some more documentary films we've actually created, that was a more of a, a humorous thing. Um, in this instance, the, um, the documentary elements of the product are designed to act as part of a larger system. And I think if you're approaching um, using, that, u- using um, skills of traditional filmmaking in a game or a, you know, in an interactive product like this, then this sort of systemic thinking from my perspective, becomes extremely important. It's, it's something that's quite alien to the way that um, documentaries are commissioned normally, which is, which is another big issue. Um, in this instance, um, the way that you make this thing, something like this work, is by treating it as software. Play Super Meat is software. Even the different bits of video that go into it are software. And again, software production, there's a lot of buzzwords in it, but one of the... the the production methodologies that I, that I guess a lot of people use, and we certainly use it as something else, is this concept of user-centered design. So it's like knowing your audience, but knowing your audience really, really well and having some specific piece of insight into your specific audiences that you can then build your system around. And the other big difference, I think, is that when we and lots of guys like us get commissioned from, um, certainly from, from Channel 4, um, the commissioning meeting isn't just a straightforward, here's the idea, yeah, go and have some money. It's the first stage in a user-centered design process. It's the first stage in, or get rid of the buzzwords, get rid of the jargon. The commissioning meeting is the first stage of the design process for a bit of software. And having that attitude, um, having that approach to what you're doing has certainly made a massive difference to, to our ability to, uh, to articulate what it is that we're trying to do. Um, I could go on, um, but I think that's probably all the major things I wanted to say. So um, I'll stop. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. I think I'm, I'd be really interested to, to, to kind of dive into what that design process feels like for creatives and technologists and people that kind of blur both uh, later on, because I think that there's a tension and, and sometimes a, a, a collaboration there, which is quite hard to get right, so I'd, I'd quite be interested about how you did that at something else. Um, so, uh, the final speaker on the panel is uh, Phil Stewart. Uh, Phil's one of the, uh, actually, I don't know your job title, I'll, I'll call you the, one of the co-founders of, uh, creative director of Preload, uh, Preloaded, who really made one of the games which hugely influenced the work that we've been doing at uh, Channel for Education, which was a game called CDX, which was commissioned about six years ago now. Yep. Uh, was it one of your commissions, Nick, actually? Proceed. Yeah, yeah, right. It was, it was to support say, yeah, a BBC right, documentary uh, series called Rome, which was a, a, a kind of dramatised drama doc about uh, the history of Rome. And CDX was an incredibly immersive and uh, beautifully rich experience that was running alongside the story. In a way, the story of CDX was about the making of the... Docu- a kind of fictional story about the making of the documentary of Rome. And it was... When, when me and Alice Taylor joined Channel 4 Education, CDX was essentially the kind of thing we wanted to try and make. So in many ways, Phil's been a huge influence on, on everything we've done in the last couple of I years. I didn't know that. Good. Well, where you go, Phil. OK, cool. So um, I'm Phil. Um, I work at Preloaded. Um, 
Margaret did a brilliant job of just sort of eulogising about the benefit of games, so I'm going to, I'm luckily I don't need to do that. I'm, I'm going to show you a kind of a real, a real example of something we've done most recently. I was going to show you 1066, which has probably been the biggest, um, most successful game we've ever made, um, which was through Channel 4 Education. I'm going to show you Trafalgar, which was the um, most recent, um, probably straight game documentary um, combination that we've done. Um, preloaded, um, we make uh, playful, interactive educational products, which really just, I mean, that took about six months to kind of nail that st statement. Really, it just means... <laughs> Um, we make a lot of games, but we also make a lot of kind of other things like kind of uh, apps and interactive experiences. Um, crucially, platform agnostic. Um, we try not to think of ourselves as doing anything particular, um, anything specific on, on um, within technology, but um, we generally do a lot of browser-based stuff. Um, today, um, I wanted to talk to you about um, a browser-based game. Um, I mentioned that we um, it's done for Channel for Education. Um, we did it in March, um, March this year. It was for um, a Channel 4 season, which was called Bloody, Bloody Foreigners, um, which was all about the, the role of non-British British nationals in making Britain great. Um, there were four um, documentaries that were commissioned. One was um, for the Black King of Scotland. Another one was the Polish Air Force um, pilots, um, the infamous uh, 303 Squadron. There was one about the Battle of Trafalgar, which is the game we made. And there was another one which I've forgotten. Great Fire of London. Great Fire of London. So um, two games were commissioned. Um, we did one of them, and we chose Trafalgar because we just sort of felt it was going to be the best, the best, uh, best uh, material for the game. The objectives, now this is kind of like our take on it, but this, Matt, you might disagree. The objectives were um, to entertain the audience, um, to educate, and I think the last one, whilst this is a standalone product, it was to try and drive traffic to, um, well, not traffic, drive views to 4OD and try and increase some figures. And actually, this, the game was actually um, before the, the documentary went out, so it had the opportunity to try and mobilise a bit of audience around that. Um, I thought I'd show you this. This is the starting point for um, the documentary and also the starting point for us. Um, this is a logbook from um, one of the boats in Nelson's fleet. Um, it's called the Rotherham's Log, and it's the, um, it was the first documentary um, documented um, list of crew on um, any of Nelson's, um, uh, Nelson's boats. Um, it basically details the names, the roles, the nationalities, and the wages of all the crew that were actually on, on those boats. Um, and in a very sort of British way, um, everyone, and even if they were sort of like Spanish or French or American, they were all given very um, British names. So this was the starting point for the documentary and also the starting point for, for our game. So the challenge um, for us really was to try and take this battle and make it interesting. Now, the challenge for us in terms of building a game was how do you make something that's very linear and the outcome's known into something that's kind of exciting. So rather than focusing on the actual battle, which is obviously what this is, we took the 50 years um, leading up to the actual event. So we worked with a guy called Brian Lavery, who um, was also the historical consultant on the documentary, um, and we asked him to go and look for scenarios and battles and skirmishes and events that happened leading up to that time for us to then model the game mechanics on. So he came back with us with a mountain of research, um, and then we turned that into a game. So the game is um, essentially a battle game, but at the heart it's all about crew management. So it's about managing the different nationalities that you can then hire. So you can hire Americans, um, slaves, um, French deserters, Spanish prisoners, and they become part of your fleet on the boat. Um, all of the missions, it's, I think there's about 25 different missions in total, all of the missions are fact factually accurate. Um, and I was just going to show you a video. That's it.
that's the game. Um, so we launched it um, six months ago. Um, in that time, we've had 10.8 million missions being played. Pretty amazing amount of number. Um, 12 minutes average game time. And the other, the other thing, which was kind of like our sort of semi-mission when we set out, was just to try and drive, drive some views to 4OD. And I don't know if you know these figures, but it's... I, I haven't seen them before. Yeah, They're great. 430,000 yeah. people have gone to 4OD to watch it, which is pretty amazing. So um, I thought I only had five minutes, so that's all I've done. I have got... It's good. We can end it there. Um, but that's, that's my example. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So... There's, there's, there's three kind of words in particular that I want to pick up. Initially, we'll do, we'll do a brief chat on the panel and then open it up to Q&As. And, and, and three words really stuck out for me in, in, in those presentations. One was the idea of, of fun and the tension, in a way, between the idea of creating... All games are driven by um, a, a, a cycle of play, learning, challenge, which has to be fun in the end. You know, there, there has to be an enjoyable experience when game is in the game. There's a, a great book by a guy called Raf Costa called Theory of Fun, that if you're interested in this area, is really worth reading. And he talks about how fun and kind of learning and challenging are all absolutely inherently at the heart of games. So partly I want to talk about the challenge of, of dealing with sometimes really difficult subject matter and fun. You know, is that just a combination which will never work? The second thing I want to talk about after that is, is this idea of systems and design thinking, you know, how is the process of creating systems and software uh, different from the more linear process of making a film? And then lastly, uh, uh, Phil, you kind of queued it up really nicely by talking about uh, the amount of attention and the patterns of attention you're getting around games and how that can link back to um, more traditional forms of attention in, in, in docs. So maybe to start with on fun, I mean, from you, you Nick, talked about... Uh, Wallace and Gromit as something which the, re the real aim was to create a fun experience and something which people would enjoy playing with. Could you imagine creating games around and, you know, you've got a, a, a number of people doing really innovative work around documentaries and cross-platform at Channel 4, uh, BBC including, wish you're thinking there, um, wish you were at Channel 4 <laughs> um, doing interesting stuff at BBC like Adam Curtis's blog and stuff like that could you imagine creating game-like experiences around a more serious subject matter? We almost did, didn't we? Anyway, yeah, sorry, we won't go there. Um, well, no, we, we, uh, well, Simpson, we, we did have some conversations <laughs> with Adam, actually. That would have been quite a mad place to go. And I think I can imagine a, a game designed by Adam Curtis would be something I would definitely want to play. But, uh, but anyway, to, to, um, but it might be quite frightening. But, the, but to, uh, to sort of answer the question, I think, for me, the reason why I brought up the subject of fun is I think there is a tendency, I think, when I've been in discussions like this about documentary and games before, and I think sometimes there is a tendency for them to get very quickly very worthy. Mm. And I think there are brilliant examples of, of, of serious games which have just gone a bit too far on the serious side of the spectrum and not enough on the, uh, on the gameplay. And I think we do have to remember that what we're trying to do is create, first and foremost, the aim of the Wallace and Gromit game is actually to inform people about the physics of engineering. The, the route to that is it's really good fun and it's got great character. And I think we, what we need to do is we need to sort of um, be less, uh, I suppose, be less literal in the way that we try and tackle the subject and try and find the right way, the fun way in. I think you, I'm sure you guys are more than familiar with the, the Jane McGonagall TED speech, which I, I watched again in preparation for this and thought, she does, she, if anyone hasn't watched it and is interested in this area, you should, you should watch this TED speech she did. It's brilliant because she... She focuses. She pulls up the uh, one of those Paul Teledano pictures. If you, they're in the Times and stuff. Uh, Paul Teledano, I think he's called this photographer who did all these shots of people playing games and that sort of moment of ecstasy that she describes as an epic win is like, oh, you know, someone's watching that. And, and her her sort of thesis at the TED talk was, what if you could convey? If what if you could harness the power of millions of people? Playing games, you know, people play games in order to feel like that, to feel good, to feel like they're having fun, to feel like they've got that epic win, whatever it is. She said, what if you could harness that to solve problems or to sort of, you know, convey messages about what's wrong with the world? And I, I think there's something incredibly powerful in that. But I do think, you know, so, that, so for me, documentaries and games, it's, it's, it's maybe not fun so much, but it's about what can we tap into in terms of personal motivation to get people to do things that are really going to make a difference or engage with subjects that they wouldn't otherwise engage well, with. Well, Margaret, I know in a lot of your writing about games, particularly some of the stuff you've been writing recently, you talk about how games are starting to create different emotional states. 
and, and games which sometimes you talk, in, you talk about Minecraft as something which is a kind of an engine for paranoia in a way. So how do you think games are starting to explore emotions that aren't just about that, that kind of Skinner Box style press button, get reward, press button, get reward? You know, what's, what are we seeing that's making mm-hmm. games deeper and more emotional and going into slightly different emotional territory from the cliche of a, a, a casual game? Um, I think Paul earlier was fulminating against the word gamification. Um, I think my most hated word in the world is fun. <laughs> oh, I hate the word fun. Fun causes us so much difficulty. It doesn't really mean anything, and it sounds inherently trivial, and it makes these conversations very difficult. Um, and I think it creates false oppositions that are really, really unhelpful, that we end up with this opposition between um, exactly the, the, the issues that you were tackling. Of, oh, well, this game was far too serious, and it wasn't fun enough, so that was the problem. And those things are not, those things are not the right things to be comparing. Um, there are questions of there are questions of tone, um, and there are questions of how fulfilling and rewarding an experience is. So, if you if when you when you read um, Ralph Costa's theory of fun, which you all now will, <laughs> Matt's giving you homework. Um, he'll talk about a lot of things actually that that then come into play in the Super Me project that that Paul and Phil worked on, which is that the reason that we love games, the reason that we have this Jane McGonagall moment. It's really poorly expressed by this word fun. It's it's about really deep fundamental elements of um, overcoming difficulty and of learning things and improving skills and uh, using your memory and experiencing things from different viewpoints and a whole bunch of really, really quite profound things that our brains love. Our brains go just absolutely fizzy for. That's, That's why they make us so happy. That's why they make us make that face. Getting there is not often a fun experience. If you want to, if you want to come around and, and watch me play Demon Souls tomorrow night, I'm not having fun. I'm swearing a lot. I'm sweating a lot, and, and really forcing my brain to do painful things and learn things it didn't know before. If you come around and watch me play Minecraft, you'll be carrying behind the sofa. It's you know officially scarier than Doctor Who. It's um, and, and so fun is the wrong word. So the game, the serious games that are rubbish are often not rubbish because their tone is too serious although that tone is often a mistake and I couldn't agree more with the non-literal thing, mm. they're actually usually rubbish because they're rubbish because those mechanisms <laughs> are really badly implemented. Mm. And it is perfectly possible to make a game that is very serious in tone and deals with something very dark, but which triggers all of these really powerful things that we want to trigger. Well, maybe, Paul, if you could talk about the feedback you've been getting from teens. I know that you've done some research with teens around Super Me, and, and, and what was interesting, not setting up too much, was how they came back to a project which is about happiness and what drove them to come back to that. So what have you been seeing in terms of how people are using a project which really is about helping people you know, avoid depression and avoid you know, lots of kind of uh, quite anxious and difficult feelings that teens have at that time? What ha- what's working for it and what are people saying about how they're using it? It's, it's a really, really good question. Um, first of all, I think one of the main reasons that people use it is because it's a lot of fun. Um, LAUGHTER no, um, it, it is. He's right. <laughs> no, um, it's it's a really good question. Um, what we tried to do when we when we made the system was tr- to try and you. It's a lot of the research that we did before we started. The, the, the most important thing is the research that we did before we actually started. You know, writing a single line of code or doing a single piece of design um, suggested some some tricky things. Which is that first of all, if you tell a teenager that this stuff is good for you, it'll help you be happier, more resilient, and you won't get depressed, They'll, they will tell you to fuck off straight away. Um, and then they will. Um, that, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that there's a similar reaction to, towards uh, education, which is, a, which is quite a strange thing. Um, we set out to do something that, that did not feel worthy. It may have... It didn't shy away from doing a lot of things, like, for example, one of the documentary films inside the, the, the system was about a, a woman who lost her twin sister, you know, and she was there, she saw her die, and it was about her reconstructing her life. And some of the other games, again, were designed to be, in quotes, good games, which means that they could well be infuriating, they could well be um, annoying, but eventually they'd be quite rewarding. Um, and this is, good. this is by way of answering your question, I promise. Um, for example, one of the most important things that our research said 
that you could do for anyone, in fact, this is a, a potentially a more important skill than literacy at certain ages, is the ability to be able to reflect accurately on your own circumstances, this idea of reflection. So uh, let's say after this, I think this has been the worst speech I've ever done, the worst panel. I made an absolute idiot of myself. I'm never going to do another one. In fact, maybe I didn't do too badly, or that, that would be bad. Again, if I think that this is, I'm an absolute genius and this is the best thing I've ever done and I walk out of here in a, you know, with, a, with a massive head, and then people would give me a, a bad response as well. So either catastrophizing something or being over, you know, or underestimating or overestimating how well something's gone is very bad for you. So long, long story short, we were able to turn things like that into a game. One of the games that we worked on with, with Phil was... Uh, you, it's a physics game where you've got to you know, trial and error and then you gradually work out how objects affect gravity inside a scene. But the real game is when you're being asked to assess how well you've done between the levels. And that was actually encouraging people to think about um, reflection. And as a result, what we found, this is actually answering your question, is that people have come back to the system. They've come back more than once um, and they've come back for uh, 20, 30, 40 minutes, which is quite, which is, which is quite special. So... And all I can say is that um, it's achieved a few different things. It's achieved hundreds of thousands, millions of plays, repeat plays, extended usage, and it's also not been thought of uh, as um, as shit, which is which is a very very tr- which is a very very tricky thing to pull off with teenagers. Um, I mean, can I can I? So I was, I was just going to ask a question. I think one of the things that that we really enjoy at Preloaded is when you do a sequence of... So we've been doing kind of games for about 10 years, but every game you do, you sort of learn something new. And I think with see for me, we felt... Well, I, I felt that we were trying to approach it in quite an oblique way, so we weren't trying to be too direct about what the, what the kind of learnings were. They were almost kind of like hidden within the system. And from the, re- from the research that we got back, I kind of felt that almost hiding it was going against what people wanted, and actually the audience wanted it to be more direct and almost kind of more overt in terms of the... So they, they the want outcomes. to know what they're learning yeah. in the game. They and want I, that to be reflected back to them. And I think we've, we... I mean, maybe we were sort of taking a reaction going kind of almost the other way and trying to not make it too serious and trying to make it as fun as possible. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's yeah, a we, discussion really it's, it's interesting. I mean, there's a few things about the system that I think we'd have done differently. The, there is... In, in the website, there is some very explicit information. This game is about this. This is what, this is what a reflection is about. Click here, read more about it. Um, that's, that stuff is there. Um, I, I think that if we were to do it again, I think I would probably, I would definitely agree with Phil. I think that we could be more overt about getting the actual mechanics of resilience even more explicit in, in, in the games. And I think that we, we would also do the scoring system slightly differently. Um, so this raises an interesting question, which you know, it's been mentioned in a couple of your talks about systems thinking and design versus kind of narrative design. And in a way, that's absolutely the crux of this crossover between documentary and gaming. You know, is it possible to, you know, do games have to be like Trafalgar of Origin where you're working from, um, you know, historical sources and you're building out, you're building a game out from those kind of very, very strong narrative senses? Or can it be a lot more abstract like the games in Super Me where there is no real narrative... Uh, structure for the gameplay. The gameplay is very, very abstract indeed, but there is an underlying logic to it. I mean, how can you best kind of... I, I don't know, Margaret, if you, you can pick this one up. What's, what are the challenges and the, and, and the kind of tensions there? Um, there are lots so of challenges. Just, think... You know, the JFK game, yeah. is that offensive precisely because it's so blatantly you know, about the situation <laughs> rather than the physics and the ballistics and stuff like that? Well... You know, I th- there's, there's a lot of game theory that asks you to think about games as having sort of at least two levels, one of which is an underlying mechanical systemic level, and then one of which is um, a visual narrative level that sits on top of that, and that those two things ideally should interconnect, but are definitely separate entities, and I could take, if you throw any game at me, I could take that game, take the systems and the mechanics of that game and dress it up in completely different clothes, so it would look radically different on screen, but to a game designer would very clearly be the same game. Um, and because of that relationship, we've ended up, in a, I, I think, with a slightly kind of fake hierarchy that the idea that the, the narrative dressy up, dress up stuff at the top is the most important stuff and the systemic stuff that underlies it is less important. Um, I'm very strongly of the opinion that it's the other way around and I think the systemic stuff is the interesting stuff um, and I think 
so they're not really in opposition. If you're doing it right at all, you have to have that systemic stuff. So, so often, document, you know, the point of documentary is to inform people's worldviews. So, you know, is it is that more productive to do within that systemic level, or is it really about narrative? Can you really change someone's worldview without telling that story, without making those very specific references to to, to kind of real life and real world events? I think you can, but you may well choose to do both. But what I'm saying is, you need you need to have that systemic yeah. level there to get you it right. You can't just have the narrative layer. Well, I think I think you're you're massively missing out the the benefit of what games can bring you if you do, and you soon end up in trouble and any kind of frustrations because if you the other the other real danger is that if you come from a narrative background and you come to games with a narrative in mind you'll probably get stuck very quickly because you're trying to tell stories the way that you're used to telling stories in an environment that is built to tear stories apart um, and that usually ends with a number of people crying because um, yeah. it's not really narrative, is it? That's the thing. The stuff on top of it isn't true narrative in the sense that someone uh, writing a script for a pro for a, a, a documentary film or you know telling that story would understand it. It's a different. It's a different mm. thing. Well, there it, might be character or whatever, but, I mean, it, well, but it's it, not. It it's not be. true narrative. And there are, you know, there are games that float layer of narrative on top of layer of narrative, so that effectively have you know a series of animations running along the top that are totally linear narrative that in some cases are only thematically related to another narrative that runs below that, which is more closely related to a systemic emerging narrative that comes out through the gameplay. You can play all kinds of tricks. There's loads of fun to be had. But... But you have to have that logic underneath. You have to have that fun... It has to be there in order for the game to be good, and it kind of has to be there for you to really be properly engaging with the format. And anything that you're working on that excites you has tensions has checks and balances at the heart of it has things pulling in different directions there's bits of string that if you pull one end something else you know if I pull a bit over here what happens over here whatever you're doing there's some of that in it and start there rather than with stories and build up from that and you get a much better effect picking up I'd like to pick up the engagement thing Phil because we've got to crack on and get some questions in at the end um, I mentioned attention at the end um, I mean Nick what we've learned a lot through games is is the kind of length uh, of these projects, way ten, you know, one of the biggest challenges in documentary at the moment is getting attention, getting distribution, you know, getting your stories out there into the world. What can we learn from the kinds of attention patterns that that, that we see around games and, and and the amount of plays they're getting and the length of time they're getting them? What are you learning from the stuff you're doing at BBC? I, think, I mean, the crucial thing is that you know, the, certainly on the casual game stuff, is that you have to take the casual game to where the audience is rather than expect them to sort of seek it out or come to it and I think that's slightly more tricky for us at the BBC because we're not allowed to pay for placement <laughs> on sites some, like some others might do <laughs> 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 on sites like Miniclip which yep. immediately guarantee you huge traffic but we, you know, we don't do that rightly or wrongly but you know we, we, so for something like Wallace and Gromit we've ceded that to all sorts of sites where we don't have to pay for it um, but and, how long you know, the show lasts? How many episodes is the show? Uh, how many weeks show, is it running? That one's six weeks. So. And so how long do you imagine that you'll be getting a serious amount of traffic to that site? Just around yeah. the TX schedule or for a long time afterwards? Or no, what? well, I think it's quite... That's a really interesting point. I think that the, the traffic to the gameplay, I would expect to not particularly be dependent on the TX. So yeah. I think there, you, you will get flows through from TX to the website... Um, and to the game that way but I think the seeded game and getting out to those audiences who are already on games portals and playing games and interested in playing games I don't think there's that much relationship particularly with the TX but you know that's, that's emerging Phil what are you seeing around I mean you mentioned that great stat which I hadn't seen before about yeah. uh, Trafalgar well we I mean in terms of so 1066 and Trafalgar are probably the, the best examples of this 1066, we didn't really see much more than, I think there was like a spike of 10,000 people after the, after the documentary went out. Um, but we're, we're getting, I think, 50,000 plays a day on 1066, just continuously. And that's like, a year and a half after broadcast. Year and a half after. Yeah. So the, the, the pattern of attention is still really strong. Yeah. And where's that coming from? I mean, where is, you know, where is that? We're not marketing the game. We haven't marketed it on Channel 4 yeah, since so, May I mean, 2009. So what's driving that attention? Whereabouts so where's that actually coming from? Yes, yeah, so the, game, the game sits on Channel 4. Com, um, but it's designed to be portable, so it exists on kind of portals across across the world. So, I mean, most of those have been kind of like ripped directly from Channel Four. It's pirated. Also pirated. Um, it's also embedded on places like Congregate and Miniclip and the main the main game portals. Um, most plays come from uh, Congregate, 
um, mini clip. We're not on mini clip because we didn't pay for placement. Um, massive amount of plays coming from China. Um, I mean, I think it's worth worth saying all the all the figures stated. I mean, they're global figures, and the UK audience is usually about 20% of that. Um, but 1066 seems to be very popular in, in China. So we're teaching battle theory yeah, tactics exactly. to the Chinese. Very good. Um, yeah, interesting. I mean, just stat on that one. I think from from what I've seen, it's kind of anything like you know one tenth to one fifth of the traffic going to the. BBC site as it's actually going to play the game as yeah. it's playing it elsewhere. You know, it's a, it's really a small percentage that are going to come to us. It's it really is that audience that's already out there somewhere. Yeah. So I'm kind of, you know, it is quite viable to consider the, the you know, if you, if you want to deal with an issue and you want to get a long kind of period of attention over about a year or so, you should think about when you release TV, when you release games, and how you can drive one to the other. I think we're just starting with 1066, there wasn't a lot of crossover yeah. between the game audience and the TV audience, and we deliberately set out with Trafalgar to include calls to action in the game, saying, go and watch a documentary in 4OD, and I'm pleased it's worked. I mean, yeah, it worked, it worked brilliantly. Is, is, is really interesting. I mean, what, what was great about Trafalgar was we were starting production at the same time that they were, um, they'd done all their kind of like rough, rough cuts, and they were basically in the edit suite putting stuff together, so we were working with them, we had all the scripts, we knew all the... All the, all the um, the kind of the key characters in, in the um, in the show. We had all the sounds. There was a really kind of collaborative relationship. So the starting point was that log, um, and then we just sort of went off, took all the learnings that they were trying to deliver, and then we basically built a separate game. So I see them as like you know the game is a standalone product, sitting alongside the documentary, but they really are just one product. Yeah. You know I don't really see them as separate products, but they are individually standalone. Great. Okay, that's a good point to go to the floor. If anyone wants to ask a question, can you put your hand up? And then I'll start with Malik Can you wait for the mic? Because it is being recorded. And can you just say, it's really wasn't really nice to know who you are. Um, thank you very much. Um, hello. Yeah, uh, I'm Rob Barker. Um, and, uh, well, yeah, really interesting chat. I guess my question would revolve around inducing feelings and kind of slightly richer um, interactions. Um, I watched a documentary called Into Eternity yesterday. It was about a nuclear um, fuel dump which has got to store stuff for 100,000 years. Now, if I was to play the video game of that, it would probably be Manic Miner. Um, now, I guess my point is that a lot of the time it feels as if um, films and some video games, some kind of things like Silent Hill and Silent and Minecraft can, can induce incredible feelings, but quite often I feel as if the, the games associated with movies, documentaries and so on are very reductive, they're, they're little more than hoops and sticks. Um, I guess I'm just interested in the panel kind of perhaps talking about the most satisfying and rich examples of inducing um, perhaps slightly not run of the mill feelings um, in their audience through their work. Margaret, do you want to start? This is a five hour session, right? <laughs> um, I mean, like, really oceans to say on that. And, and also, I think it's again really dangerous to think that games have only been doing this stuff latterly. I mean, you, you know, um, Manic Miner, some interesting stuff to say about that. There's very interesting stuff to say about Jesse Willy. Um, which I mean, there really, really is. These are, you know, I mean, Jesse Willy, arguably a very early documentary game, a, a, a very tragic. Um, it w- absolutely was, you know. I, I guess just in terms kind of self referential. So there's, there is really interesting stuff there. I mean, I think I was thinking today about showing a thing called um, uh, Inside a Dead Skyscraper, which some of you may know. Um, which is a modern industria game that was actually really conceived as a music video. And it's um, a really heartbreaking game about the moment um, that the first aircraft hit one of the Twin Towers on December the 11th. Um, set against this very tranquil song, um, where... I, it's, and, I, and I can't really do it justice in words. You should really go and have a look. It'll only be five minutes of your life. But it's this unbelievably delicate little representation of that moment, frozen in time, when the, the terrible thing has happened, but the horror hasn't impacted yet. And you can fly freely around this very, very simplified environment and, and eavesdrop on the thoughts of all of the people on the street below who are all thinking trivial, scattered, different things. Um, and for a long time you don't seem to be able to have any impact on the world at all. And you eventually realise that there's only one tiny point of interactivity there, which is on, on one of the viewing platforms in a different building, there's a little girl who has lost a balloon, and you have the power to get her balloon back to her, and that's the only power that you have. And you can't undo this, you can't make it right, but you're, 
you share in this moment with all of these people at this, uh, just sitting on this knife edge where everything goes from being okay to not being okay. But um, Paolo, who, who made it, kind of understood that he had, he had to give you something. There has to be some little tiny moment of resolution. And I, could, I couldn't write a book because I'm not eloquent enough about what playing that made me feel. And, and something certainly far subtler and harder to express than, oh, there was a loud noise and now I'm scared, or yay, I killed a guy and won the medal. Um, so there's absolutely a huge vocabulary, and there's, there's all kinds of games. Um, and I can, I've, I've written screeds on this, so I can, I can happily give you all links to stuff about the really complex emotional palette of games. So I think where you look at things that disappoint you, what you're seeing is a, is a shortfall in the imagination of people who made them, not in the Format. potential of the form. Yeah. And I think you know, what's interesting is a lot of these games are being made by small independent production teams who have kind of spun out of large... AAA console game teams because they were bored of making a yet another game where you've got to beat somebody up quicker than their opponent and, and they're wanting to explore a different palette and a different way of, of creating games so there's a lot of analogies again in sexually between uh, linear documentary film production and the game sector you know the really interesting stuff tends to be happening at the margins tends to be happening by people who, who see the reduction of their craft in the mainstream and want to kind of move slightly outside and, and start doing interesting things okay uh, second question man and then we'll go to the lady over there afterwards. Hi, my name is Adam, and I'm an executive producer at Kazoo Creative. We, on the one hand, this is very, very interesting. Um, uh, on the one hand, we do AAA games uh, where we do the cutscenes and the trailers for games like Call of Duty and Little Big Planet, which are a lot about building worlds. On the other hand, we do CGI for documentaries on Channel 4 like Incredible Athletes. So this is a very, very uh, interesting uh, discussion for me. Um, I'm kind of wondering on the practical side, how much, as commissioning editors and, and the producers here, how much do you have the freedom of considering the game part of it as, as, as important as the program itself that the game is backing? Is the game just another way of kind of furthering the marketing on, on the website? Or do you, as a, as, as a broadcaster, can you actually find the budget or looking at doing that? Or, or is that already happened of giving the game the same backing that you're giving the program on the one hand, and on the other hand, how much of an interaction is there between the game developer, producer, maker, and the director, producer of the program itself? If that makes sense. Maybe, I mean, I can obviously answer this not from a chair's position, but maybe we'll start with Phil talking about your experience on 1066 in Trafalgar. Yeah, so um, I think for us it's really important that there is this kind of synergy between the two products. Um, I mean, as a producer, we want to make the best possible game, and there is, there is a relationship between the two things. I think at the start, it's about sitting down you know, with the two parties and understanding where there is going to be that crossover. 1066, as an example, um, it was quite a low-budget documentary. Um, it was uh, done by Hardy, Hardy Pictures, um, and they were focusing on the kind of humanity of battle. The kind of like, it was very much about the individuals in that battle. So that was our kind of cue in terms of building a game that didn't try and model the kind of like mass armies, but kind of individuals within it. So that was our kind of like our, our cue. And they just let us run with it. So, you know, in terms of um, that's where there was, you know, a kind of, a, I guess, a kind of a crossover. We worked with all of their art department as well. So we had, all, all, there was a kind of like a relationship between all the flags and the colours and, and the units that were being used. So, I mean, we, we kind of feel very proud that there is a kind of um, a strong relationship between the two. But like I said like earlier, they are standalone products. Yeah. Nick, what's, what's your experience at the BBC? I think, I mean, for us, the, I think there probably is, in documentary, it's one of the areas where there probably is parity between what we would spend on a game and what we would spend on a show because you know you're talking about budgets of between tens and low hundreds of thousands um, and you know that's what we could realistically spend on a game and I think for us it wouldn't be about just marketing the show if we're going to commission a game it's not the easiest thing for the BBC to commission a game actually there's a lot of stipulations about competitive impact about not doing things that the commercial sector could offer we actually are only allowed to commission things which we can um, show some sort of meaningful impact um, from. So, you know, I think actually there is a real opportunity with the BBC to commission some very interesting, quite subtle games, but we won't do many. We won't do many. And, and I think I'd love to find the right project that really kind of took some of that subtlety. I mean, that sounds absolutely amazing. I'm not, I wasn't aware of that game, but that sounds really interesting. I would love to explore some of that sort of subtlety and do a project that really shows that. Um, in terms of budgets, though, if we're talking about big budgets, we're never going to be in the territory of the console games. You know, that's just not no. what we're going to be about. The biggest budget for any 
game that the BBC uh, commissioning budgets have funded to date is the Doctor Who Adventures, which was, you know, it's fantastic stuff. It's all sort of interwound with the narrative of the last season. You know, they did these three completely interactive episodes, and that was, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't actually know what the budget was, but it was over a million, probably less than two million, I don't really know. But it's kind of, that was a serious, serious budget. And even that is a drop in the ocean when you're talking about Call of Duty. So, you know, we're not in that territory. And I think, I think what we need to find is a few really smart examples where we can take kind of the subtlety, public purpose, all of those great things about an organisation like the BBC and just do something very credible and interesting. But I mean, there's, there's some money there, but it's... It's about the quality of the idea and the imagination rather than very high production. Value. Very quickly, at Channel 4, obviously the education team, two-thirds of the slate at games. I mean, you know, Super Me is a completely integrated product. A lot, a lot of the commissioning is just games. We, we are currently doing another project with Preloaded um, about faith um, and kind of young people and ideas of, of, of faith and death, and that's, that's a really big project that's, that's purely... Uh, um, purely a game. So I think what I'm starting to do in my newer role as, as head of multi-platform is, is to come up with a strategy for how we work more closely with, say, Specialist Factual and others on projects which originate. But in entertainment, we're doing it. Million Pound Drop is a games format, um, which is a live play-along game online alongside the quiz show, which is live in the studio. So I think we're starting to see these kinds of projects de- developed for a peak you know, not just in areas like education, which are, which are off-peak. We're starting to see them developed in peak as, as unified projects. So final question, the lady over there. Um, there's a mic. Thank you. Um, Sandra Gaudenzi from uh, Goldsmith University. I, I was interested in that conversation between the difference of uh, systemic logic and uh, a sort of document, linear documentary logic. And I, I just wanted to go a little bit more in specific. For example, if we go back to SuperMe and... Uh, to a topic like, uh, you know, teenager and happiness. Um, I completely buy the fact that, you know, to do a game or a system is different than just to do a linear story. And that is not about being better or worse, but just being different. But what I'm interested in is what does different mean? So in that example, you could have made um, a 90-minute, 60-minute documentary about happiness and teenager, or you could do a game and a website. Then the question is how do you measure and what do you think are the real difference between those two? Why are they different? How do they impact differently the audience, i.e. your teenagers? What can they offer? And do you at a certain point you know, do a list of what can we achieve with this medium, what can we achieve with the other one, and how do you choose if maybe you want to combine them? The lady next to you seems to want to build on that, so I'll give her a quick chance. Um, yes, uh, I don't know whether most of the panel you're just involved in sort of games that educate, but in the spirit of Margaret's fun, can we just not use the word for a minute? Can we just not the, use the word educate and instead talk about fantasy and escapism? Yeah, um, we, is that a new area? Of, believe me, we really avoid the word educate in Channel out? for Education. Um, partly because actually I think what's, what's interesting in games is they're performative. And, and if there's one thing to define the 14 to 19 age group that, that we commissioned for in Channel for Education, it's about performing ideas of who you might be. You know, a lot of our themes are not about formal learning, as in maths and science and physics. They're more about understanding the transition from adolescence into adulthood. And an awful lot of that is about performance. It's about trying out different versions of yourself and, and getting feedback on that. And we find games are a brilliant format for that. So, yeah, I, I agree. We, we, we use, hardly ever use the word education in our projects at all. But actually, going back to the Supni question, you, mm. you know, Supni has a lot of short documentaries in it. So do you want to talk about what you're trying to get from those short films, what they are, how you made them, what, what the decisions behind yeah. making the films and making the games at the same time? First of all, I think it's a, it's a really, really interesting question um, and, a, and, a, and a very, very important one. I think that, for me, a, a way in to answering it about the difference between how one would approach a, a thing that is you know, conceived as a, as a whole, like a documentary that has an objective and a, a linear path to achieving it, and the system is this. But if I was going to go and pitch to Channel 4 a documentary, it's called The Boy Whose Face Fell Off, and it's, uh, it's going to be directed by Nick Brumfield, then we can all go, well... Okay, it's good. Young, young fella in a lot of pain. Yeah, I can see the kind of that working with sensitive bit of, bit of humour. I can, you know, you can imagine how it's going to be already. Um, if I was going to pitch a game that was going to be in any way related to the, the same kind of sensations that that documentary might evoke, I've absolutely no idea what it's going to be like until I, until I get started, until I start approaching the system and uh, start thinking about the end, the end user. With teens, 
I think the reason why there aren't that many documentaries commissioned for, let's say, that particular audience is because it's actually quite hard to reach those. They don't, they don't tend to watch documentaries. Well, obviously they do, but they, they may not watch you know, the sort of documentaries that, uh, I guess, get talked about here, up here a lot. But they do play games. So that's the first thing. So the first thing is a, is a fundamental um, choice of the best way to reach a specific audience, which in, is in itself a design decision. And then beyond that, as Margaret said, you can imagine 50, 100 games that superficially look completely different, but they are in fact exactly the same game. They've got the same mechanic, the same thing at, at the heart of them. Um, but when you're actually creating a game, it's because a game is inherently a system, it, it is inherently a piece of software, and it is inherently um, needs to be approached using the sort of method- methodologies that you approach for software, you really don't know exactly how it's going to work, what, what, you know, what kind of shape the system is going to be until you start that, pro- that process of design, because it could go in so many different directions. And this, is, incidentally, is a, is a fundamental difference when you're, again, when you're getting something commissioned, because I want to be able to, to say to a commissioning editor or someone that's going to give me some money to make something, here is this thing. It's going to be absolutely beautiful. I haven't got a clue what it's going to be yet. <laughs> Can I have some money, please? You know, several hundreds of thousands of pounds would be great. And, and that's, that's a really, really difficult, really difficult discussion to have. It's all right, we're used to it. <laughs> okay. In, um, just very quickly, in terms of the different impacts... That's a, that's a very big question, but at a really basic level, there's a lot you can see actually neurologically and, and physiologically. So there's um, a chap at London Metropolitan University called Dr. Steve Moore, who's doing some very interesting work watching um, live brain impact and cortisol level impact and all kind of other things on people playing versus people watching. So there is, there is also hard science stuff that, that I'm spending more time with this year that's really interesting. Great. Um, and on that hard science point, we'll draw this session to a close. I'd like to thank Paul Bennon, Phil Stewart, Nick Cohen, and Michael Robson.